Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here today. I'm going to be telling you a lot about the Tuskegee Airmen, but as a matter of introduction, let me tell you a little bit more about where I work and where I got some of the information. I work at the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell Air Force Base. My wife Ellen is in the audience. She used to work there too, and there are some of you who also might have connections with the Air Force Historical Research Agency. The agency is the primary repository of Air Force historical documents. Some of those documents that we have relate to the histories of Air Force units. For example, we have the monthly histories of the 332nd Fighter Group in World War II. We have the monthly histories and sometimes other periodic histories of the 99th Fighter Squadron, the first black fighter squadron, the first black flying unit in U.S. history. We have also other kinds of documents such as oral histories and personal papers. We have orders that awarded various personnel such as the Tuskegee Airmen, distinguished flying crosses or aerial victory credits. We have missing air crew reports. We have escape and evasion reports. We've got all kinds of documents relating to units but most of the documents at the Air Force Historical Research Agency are those that relate to the uh, units and not to the personnel. If you want information on personnel, you might have to go to the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis to get more information about them. But if you want histories of the units, if you want histories of personnel who are commanders of units or of pilots, we have plenty of that information at the agency. And if you uh, want to see me about how to visit the agency or get contact information, I'll be glad to talk with you uh, after the program. This is a picture of the first African-American pilot, but he was not a member of the U.S. military. He had to fly for the French Air Service in World War I. Does anybody remember when the first airplane was invented? It's in 1903. And the Army got its first aircraft in 1909. But the U.S. military did not have black pilots until 1942. That's more than 30 years uh, that the military, the U.S. military, did not have any black pilots. And the reason, of course, was racism. Just to give you an example of the racism that prevailed at the time, there was a war college study in 1925 that examined, supposedly examined the performance of various units and various personnel in World War I and concluded that blacks were inferior and they should not be given the opportunity to be in certain positions. Uh, part of that prejudice uh, involved the idea that uh, black officers should not be in charge of white enlisted men. And that was part of the prejudice at the time. But there were certain black pilots despite that, before 1942. And there were civilian pilots. There were a few black pilots like Eugene Bullard, who was from Columbus, Georgia, who went overseas and was able to serve as a, a military pilot, but only in the service of a foreign government. But that all changed. In 1940, Franklin D. Roosevelt was running for an unprecedented third term. No president had ever, ridden, uh, ever uh, campaigned for a third term before. And Franklin D. Roosevelt wanted to uh, appeal to several different audiences, and he promised that he would make available military pilot training for black officers in the Air Corps, something that had never been done before. And he fulfilled his promise in 1941. Of course, the election was 1940. He took office again for his third term in 1941. And he did fulfill his promise. At the beginning of March 1941, the first black flying unit was constituted and activated. It was the 99th Pursuit Squadron. And it was in Chanute, Illinois. The problem was it had no pilots yet. The pilots had to be trained somewhere. And they had to decide where the pilots would be trained. And the, there was some debate about that. 
there were civilian pilot schools all around the country that were training pilots, many of whom would eventually be military pilots and have military flight training. So when the question came up about where they would be trained, Tuskegee was the place that was chosen. And let me give you some reasons why Tuskegee was chosen. Number one was the climate. One of the contenders for the black pilot training in the military was Chicago. There was a, a very active civilian pilot training program in the Chicago area. But Chicago wasn't chosen partly because of the climate. There were many good, better days, many more good days of flying weather in Alabama than there were in Illinois. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason was because black civilian pilot training was already taking place at Tuskegee. Tuskegee Institute was already famous as an institution of black learning that appealed to uh, all, many people all around the country. It had a reputation. And then finally, another reason, not so, uh, not so good a reason, was because Tuskegee was an area of the country where segregation was the norm, and the black pilot training was going to be segregated. The Army insisted on that, partly because of this old idea that black officers, and a pilot is an officer, black p officers were not supposed to be in charge of white enlisted men, so it was a segregated program. You might have seen this picture before. How many of you have seen that photograph before? Okay, it's a very famous photograph. You can see Eleanor Roosevelt is in an aircraft, the Piper Cub, at the Civilian Pilot Training School at Tuskegee, and she's riding with Chief Anderson, Charles Anderson. Charles Anderson was a civilian pilot instructor who later became an instructor at the primary flight school at Moton Field. This was not taken at Moton Field. It was taken at Kennedy Field, which was in, on the Tuskegee Institute. It was owned by Tuskegee Institute. It's not Moton Field where the primary flight training took place because that field hadn't been built yet. Sometimes you hear the story, and you might have heard this too, that Eleanor Roosevelt flew with the black pilot, Chief Anderson, and went back and convinced her husband to start training black pilots for the military. But that's not the way it happened. The military, and FDR was the instigator for this, the War Department had already agreed that it would allow the training of black pilots in the military, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, which later became the 99th Fighter Squadron, had already been activated, constituted and activated. But when this was taken, it was the end of March 1941. Eleanor Roosevelt knew that the pilots would be trained, the military pilots would be trained at Tuskegee. And that's one of the reasons she visited Tuskegee. Another reason was to help raise money for a fund, the Rosenwald Fund, that would help raise money for institutions like Tuskegee Institute for black education. And it helped raise funds for the construction of Moton Field, where the primary flight training took place. Now let me tell you a little bit about the flight training at the beginning. There were three basic phases of flight training. There was the primary phase, and that took place at Moton Field, which is now the Tuskegee Airport. I don't know how many of you have been to the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site. Have, have any of you been there? Several of you, okay. That is not where most of the training took place. That's where the primary flight training took place in biplanes like this. But there were two other phases of training, the basic flight training and the advanced flight training, which took place at a much larger airfield, Tuskegee Army Airfield, which was several miles to the northwest of Moton Field. And that's out in, ruin, in ruins now. I don't know if any of you have seen those ruins, but it's not a tourist attraction. It's hard to get to. The road there is terrible. It's full of potholes. But that's where the, the basic and advanced flight training took place. I'll show you a picture of that field in a, f a few minutes. But Moton Field was where the primary flight training took place. Moton Field was owned by Tuskegee Institute. And for that reason, sometimes people get the idea that the black military pilots all trained at Tuskegee Institute. Well, they started their training at Tuskegee Institute technically because they went through the primary flight training at Moton Field. 
but that's not where they got most of their military flight training. This is one of the planes they flew in the primary flight training. It's a biplane. It looks like a World War I plane. But all of the pilots, black and white, in primary flight training use this kind of aircraft. My dad was a B-24 pilot in World War II, and he went through primary flight school in Lafayette, Louisiana, and flew the same kind of plane. But this was only the primary flight training. I have the different types of flight, primary flight trainers there, the PT-13, PT-17, PT-19. The PT-13 and PT-17 look just like that plane. The only difference was the engine type. When they finished the primary flight training, and most of the primary flight training at Tuskegee, Tuskegee Institute's Moton Field was done by black flight instructors, like Chief Anderson, who was the, the main instructor at Moton Field. When they moved to the other field, the training was by military officers who were all white at first. All of the flight trainers at, Moton, at uh, Tuskegee Army Airfield were military officers who were white because there were no black pilots yet. Eventually, at the end of the war, there were some uh, black flight instructors at Tuskegee Army Airfield. This is an aerial view of Tuskegee Army Airfield in the 1940s. And you can see it looks almost like a mini city. There's not much left of that today. If you looked at an aerial view from Google satellite, you wouldn't see much left. The, one of the runways was developed and used as a, as a drag strip in the 1950s. So if you saw an aerial view today, you'd see one of the runways looks a little bit better preserved than some of the others. But this was a major base. It was the most important base for the training of black military flying officers for basic and advanced flight training. For the basic training, they used BT-13 aircraft. For the advanced training, they used AT-6 aircraft. If there were going to be future fighter pilots, if there were going to be future bomber pilots flying multi-engine aircraft, they would be flying twin-engine aircraft. So they used AT-10 aircraft for that training. This was the commander of Tuskegee Army Airfield and the flying school there for most of World War II, Noel Parrish. And I want to tell you a little bit more about him. Noel Parrish was a white southerner. He was born in Kentucky. He spent much of his uh, ch childhood years growing up in Texas. He was a southerner, but he was open-minded. He was less racist than a lot of his fellow southerners. He became the commander of Tuskegee Army Airfield partly because of his experience at Bowdoin Field. He had started out as the director of training there, the military director of training. Moton Field had a, or Tuskegee Institute had a contract with the War Department for the primary flight school. Then he moved over to the Tuskegee Army Airfield, became the commander there. And to show you what kind of man he was, during his administration, his predecessor had segregated all the facilities at Tuskegee Army Airfield. But the question came up about whether the dining facilities, whether the other facilities on the base would be integrated. In fact, there were some black officers that went into the white dining hall and demanded service. They got the service, but there were complaints to the commander, Noel Parrish. Noel Parrish said, let the facility be integrated. He didn't stand in the way. He knew that if you interpret the Army regulation strictly about the facilities on the base, there was no segregation. So he allowed the integration. He encouraged the training of the black military officers, the black pilots, and he was truly interested in their success. In fact, the Tuskegee Airmen recognized that fact. I've been to eight, uh, Amy said seven, but that was an old <laughs> biography. I've been to eight Tuskegee Airmen National Conventions now. And a lot of the Tuskegee Airmen whom I've met have talked about Noel Parrish. And they said that he was open-minded, he was in, in, interested in their success. They even named an award that they present every year, the Noel Parrish Award, and award it to a Tuskegee Airman every year. And so they, they respected this man and they thought that he had done uh, them uh, the service by encouraging their success. Not all the white officers were like that, and I'll give you some examples of some others in just a few minutes.
One other thing I want to mention about him before we get off the slide is Noel Parrish, after the war, went to Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base. And he wrote a thesis that encouraged the Air Force to integrate. He said there was no reason why they should have separate training for blacks and whites. Their equal ability, equal if they're given equal opportunity, there's no reason to have two different separate training programs for blacks and whites. It was wasteful and it was unnecessary. And that's another reason why Noel Parrish is considered a hero among the Tuskegee Airmen. This is an example of a class of Tuskegee Airmen pilots at Tuskegee Army Airfield. There were 44 classes that went through the program in the course of the training, but not all of them were the same size. The first class had only five. There were 13 that entered, and there were only five who graduated from that first class. But there were several different classes after that, 44 classes altogether, and there were of different sizes. Some of them had many more uh, troops than others did. So the training took place at Tuskegee Army Airfield, the basic and advanced flight training. When they graduated, they got their wings, and they got to be uh, military officers who were not also pilots. This is another picture of a class of Tuskegee Airmen pilots who were going through the training at Tuskegee Army Airfield. And I wanted to mention that some of the pilots trained in twin engine aircraft, AT-10 aircraft, to be future bomber pilots. So they were single engine classes and twin engine classes. And so some of the pilots actually trained to fly bombers, or future planes that would be like bombers. The twin engine AT-10 was not too different from the B-25 as far as having two engines, same kinds of controls. There were some Tuskegee Airmen pilots too that flew liaison type aircraft. That plane that I showed you earlier with Eleanor Roosevelt in it was a Piper Cub. The Army had a military version of that plane called the L-4. And some Tuskegee Airmen trained to be liaison pilots to help the Army with directing artillery and reconnaissance and other flights for the Army. Sometimes I used to get this question about, were there any Tuskegee Airmen that went to the Pacific in World War II? And I used to say, no, the Tuskegee Airmen went to Italy during World War II. But I was wrong, because there were a handful of Tuskegee Airmen who actually went to the Pacific in other units, Army units, because they were liaison pilots. So Tuskegee Army Airfield was training fighter pilots, bomber pilots, liaison pilots. It was the only place where black pilots could get their wings during World War II, and that's why it was such an important place during World War II. This is the emblem of the first black flying unit in history, the 99th Fighter Squadron. I want to tell you a little bit about the 99th first, and then I want to talk about the emblem itself. I mentioned the 99th Pursuit Squadron, later 99th Fighter Squadron, was the first black flying unit in history. It was also the first black flying unit that went overseas that took part in combat. At first, it was by itself. Normally, a fighter squadron was assigned to a group that had three squadrons. But the 99th was the first. There was no black group yet to assign it to. So when it went overseas, it was attached to various white fighter groups that already had three white fighter squadrons. So it was kind of an orphan. It was not assigned to the white fighter groups, it was attached. And there was a commander of one of those groups, the 33rd fighter group, who tried to take them out of combat. He thought blacks were inferior and that they weren't doing as good a job as the other squadrons that were assigned to his group. He tried to take them out of combat. So he sent a note up all the way up to Washington by the chain of command. And what the War Department did was instead of taking the 99th out of combat, it launched a study to compare the P-40 pilots of the 99th with the other squadrons that were flying in the Mediterranean theater in North Africa and Sicily and Italy. And the study concluded that there was no real difference, that the black P-40 pilots were flying just as well as the other squadrons in the Mediterranean theater. There was no reason to take them out of combat. So the 99th proved 
that they were as good as the other squadrons flying P-40s for the 12th Air Force in Italy. Before we get off this slide, I wanted to show the emblem. Do you see any numerical significance in that emblem? Anything that might relate to their name? The nine stars and the nine sections in the circle around the, the emblem. They wanted people to know they were the 99th, so they had nine stars and then nine segments around that circle. The 99th Fighter Squadron, that was their emblem. Not too long, well, this is a P-40 of the kind that the 99th Fighter Squadron flew overseas. It went first to North Africa and then went to Sicily and then it went to, to the mainland of Italy. And its first job was not so much to escort bombers or to shoot down enemy aircraft. It was actually to support troops on the ground. It flew patrol missions, it flew over the ground and naval forces, it attacked enemy targets on the ground, it took part with other P-40 squadrons in attacking enemy targets on the island of Pantelleria, which is in the Mediterranean Sea near Sicily, helped force the surrender of that island without an invasion. But not by itself, there were other P-40 units involved. But those are the kinds of missions that the 99th was flying. In the meantime, black flight training was continuing at Tuskegee. And a 332nd fighter group was started with three squadrons, like the white groups. And those three squadrons were the 100th, 301st, and 302nd fighter squadrons. Those of you who live in Montgomery might know more about the 100th. The 100th Fighter Squadron still exists. It's at the Montgomery Airport. It's an Air National Guard unit. There's going to be an air show on September 8th, Red Tails over Montgomery. And part of the reason for that name is because the Red Tails were the 99th, the 100th, 301st, 302nd, 332nd Fighter Group. The 100th Fighter Squadron was one of those Red Tail squadrons. But the 332nd Fighter Group had this emblem a black panther, breathing fire. The 332nd Fighter Group was started at Tuskegee. It moved to Selfridge Field, Michigan. The flight training continued at Tuskegee, but when the pilots were trained, they were sent to Selfridge Field, Michigan, and that's where they continued to train in the types of aircraft they'd be flying overseas. And they got a new commander over there, Robert Selway, who was a little bit different from Noel Parrish. Remember I told you Noel Parrish approved of the integration of the facilities. But Robert Selway was not an integrationist. He was a segregationist. He tried to enforce segregation at the base where the 332nd Fighter uh, Group was. And there was some trouble. There was some racial trouble. Before the 332nd Fighter Group and its three squadrons deployed overseas, Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., who had been in the first class of graduates, of pilots who graduated from Tuskegee Army Airfield, who had been the commander of the 99th Fighter Squadron overseas, came back to become the commander of the 332nd Fighter Group. Black commander, first black commander of the 332nd Fighter Group. He took it overseas at the beginning of 1944, and its three squadrons. When they went overseas, they weren't flying the same kind of aircraft as the 99th. Remember, the 99th was already over there. They were already in Italy flying P-40s for the 12th Air Force. When the 332nd Fighter Group went over there, it was flying P-39 aircraft. I don't know how many of you know about the P-39 aircraft, but it wasn't an aircraft designed to shoot down enemy aircraft. It was designed to destroy targets on the ground. In fact, it had the engine behind the pilot. Very unusual for a fighter aircraft. The reason was so that the front of the aircraft could, could be available to house a cannon and the ammunition for the cannon to destroy targets on the ground. So the P-39, like the P-40, was not a fast aircraft at the time compared to the other enemy aircraft. And it was used mainly for the 12th Air Force to support the forces on the ground and to destroy targets on the ground. So the 332nd Fighter Group at first, just like the 99th Fighter Squadron before it, had little opportunity to shoot down enemy aircraft. 
When the 99th was over there in the first year, they only shot down one enemy airplane. And maybe that's one reason why the commander of the 33rd Fighter Group tried to get him taken out of combat. What he didn't realize and what a lot of people didn't realize was the 12th Air Force wasn't really designed to shoot down many aircraft. It was designed to support the forces on the ground. Despite that, eventually, the leader of the Mediterranean Allied Air Forces, Ira Aker, General Aker, made the decision to move the 332nd Fighter Group and the 99th Fighter Squadron, put them together, and have it serve the 15th Air Force. The 15th Air Force was very different from the 12th Air Force. It flew heavy bombers, B-17s and B-24s, four-engine bombers with 10-man crews. Those bombers needed fighter escorts when they flew over enemy territory. There were six fighter groups that were already escorting those bombers. But General Aker figured that they needed more. So he decided to take the black fighter group, the 332nd fighter group, and make it a fighter escort group. So there would be seven fighter escort groups instead of just six. Besides that, the 332nd fighter group would be the largest fighter group in the whole Air Force because the 99th was assigned to it so that all the black pilots would be in the same group overseas. And so after that, the 332nd Fighter Group had more squadrons than any other group. It had four instead of three. It had more aircraft and it had more pilots. And maybe that's one of the things, one of the, the things that Ira Aker was thinking about. He wanted to have more fighter escorts to protect his bombers. This is the kind of bomber they escorted. This is a B-17 Flying Fortress. And as I said, each Flying Fortress, each of the B-17s and B-24s had a crew of 10 men. So if a plane like this went down, it lost 10 men. If 60 planes went down as a Schweinfurt earlier in the war, then that was 600 men. So it was important to protect the bombers. Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., the commander of the 332nd Fighter Group, was determined to protect the bombers. And people remember him the Tuskegee Airmen remember him as making sure that they stayed with the bombers to try to protect them against enemy aircraft. And they did a very good job at doing that. This is the kind of plane they eventually flew. I told you the 99th was flying the P-40 at first. And then the 332nd Fighter Group was flying P-39s. And then they switched I don't have a picture of a P-47. They switched temporarily to P-47s. They eventually got P-51s like this, the best fighter aircraft of the Allies during World War II. It was faster, it could fly farther, it was more maneuverable than other types of fighter aircraft. I talked to some of the Tuskegee Airmen that flew this kind of aircraft and flew P-47s and I asked them, which one did you like better? Well, most of them would say, well, we like the P-51 because it was faster, it could fly farther, it had the red tails. But some of them said they preferred the P-47 because it had an air-cooled engine. And if it's water lines, it didn't have radiators with water lines to cool the engine. It had an air-cooled engine. So if it was hit in the li water lines, it wouldn't, the engine wouldn't fail. It was more survivable. And another reason, I think Bill Holloman told me this, one of the Tuskegee Airmen pilots, it had a huge engine in the front. So if they were going against an enemy aircraft, there was more protection for the fighter pilot. <laughs> so there's different opinions about the P-51 and P-47 that the Tuskegee Airmen had. They had red tails. All of the P-51 fighter groups in the 15th Air Force had distinctive tails. The 52nd Fighter Group, for example, had yellow tails. And the 31st Fighter Group had striped red tails. And the 325th uh, Fighter Group had checkerboard pattern tails, black and yellow. So each one had its own distinctive color pattern. And the reason for that was because they wanted the fighter groups to be able to tell each other apart. The, the bomber crews wanted to be able to know which group was escorting them. And they also wanted to be able to tell their aircraft from the enemy. So that's one reason why they had the, 
the distinctive color, but they got the nickname Red Tails because of that. They were stationed at Ramatelli Airfield in Italy, which was about central Italy along the Adriatic coast on the east side of central Italy. It was a very important base. It was the same area where the other fighter groups were stationed. There were six fighter groups besides the 332nd in Italy. And they were all stationed around Ramatelli. You might be able to see the 52nd fighter group, Yellow Tails, marked there on the, on the map. Ramatelli, where the 332nd fighter group was. But that's where they flew most of their missions. Between the beginning of June 1944 and the end of April 1945, they flew 312 missions for the 15th Air Force. They had flown hundreds of missions before that for the 12th Air Force. But 312 missions. Of those 312 missions, 179 were to escort bombers. So their main job was to protect the bombers. It wasn't their only job. Some of the missions were strafing missions. This is a B-24 Liberator, another type of bomber that they escorted. It had a crew of 10 men on the average, just like the B-17. My father was a B-24 bomber pilot in World War II. He flew this kind of plane, and he also had fighter escorts. But he was in England, and it was the 8th Air Force. And so he had a different set of, set of escorts than the ones in the 15th Air Force, who were sometimes escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen. I wanted to mention this, too, because at Ramatelli in December of 1944, there was a bad weather, bad winter weather that forced 18 of these B-24s to land, not at their own base, but at Ramatelli. Can you imagine? The Black Fighter Group base and these 18 B-24s landing at a Black Fighter base and all these bombers landing at the, the Black Fighter base. And they stayed there for most of a week. And during that week, these 180, remember I told you there were about 10 crewmen for every bomber. If it was 18 bombers, there were 180 white crewmen at this black fighter base, Ramatelli. And there was a lot of association between the blacks and the whites during those days. The members of the 332nd fighter group were very generous. They provided blankets, food, shelter, uh, sometimes clothing for the uh, bomber crews that were stranded at their base during that bad winter season. And when they got back on their planes, they found notes in the planes, all of these 18 planes, and it said, remember the 332nd fighter group, we're there to protect you. So a lot of those bomber crews developed a greater appreciation about the black pilots that were sometimes escorting them. They knew the 332nd Red Tails were among those groups that were escorting them to their targets and back. The most famous Tuskegee Airmen mission was the mission to Berlin, the only 15th Air Force mission to Berlin in World War II. There were a lot of bombing missions to Berlin, but most of them were by the 8th Air Force from England. The 15th Air Force was in Italy. On the 24th of March, 1945, it flew its only mission to Berlin. And the 332nd Fighter Group was among the groups, it wasn't the only group, but among the fighter groups that escorted the B-17s, they went to Berlin that day. Three of the Tuskegee Airmen, each shot down one of these ME-262 fighter jets of the Germans. The ME-262, like the one you see here, could fly 100 miles per hour faster than the P-51. So it was quite an accomplishment to be able to shoot down a plane that was 100 miles per hour faster than your own plane. And three of the Tuskegee Airmen did that. One of them, and Ellen remembers, Roscoe Brown was one of the famous Tuskegee Airmen who shot down one of these German jets. But there were three Tuskegee Airmen that shot down German jets that day. They weren't the first American pilots to shoot down German jets, but there were among them, and Tuskegee Airmen could shoot down the best German jets, or the fastest German jets. This is the most famous commander, the most famous Tuskegee Airmen of all. 
Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. I told you already he was the commander of the 99th Fighter Squadron. Then he was the commander of the 332nd Fighter Group. He eventually became the commander of the 477th Bombardment Group that never did go overseas, but was training to go overseas with B-25 bombers. So he was the most famous Tuskegee Airman of all. He eventually became the first black general in the Air Force. A lot of people don't realize this. He went to West Point. He went four years at West Point. He was ostracized. These, the faculty members and the students would not speak to him except on official business. They were trying to pressure him to quit. And that had worked with some previous black cadets at West Point. He wasn't the first black cadet at West Point. But he persevered. And he graduated, I think, 35th in his class. It was near the, near the top, not uh, in the top 10%, but uh, it was uh, probably about in the top 25 percentile of the class. And in recognition of that, West Point, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, just this past fall, dedicated their newest barracks, named after Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. So they finally recognized his uh, achievements by naming a, a barracks after him. This is, uh, I want to give you some of the record of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, they shot down during the course of their experience overseas, not only the 332nd Fighter Group, but the 99th before that. They shot down a total of 112 enemy aircraft. There were no aces. An ace is somebody who shot down at least five enemy aircraft. But there were three Tuskegee Airmen that each shot down four enemy aircraft. And there were four Tuskegee Airmen who shot down three enemy aircraft in one day. As I mentioned before, the Tuskegee Airmen flew 312 missions for the 15th Air Force, but they had flown many hundreds of missions before that for the 12th Air Force. So they flew at about 1,500 missions in the war. And 179 of the missions were bomber escort missions. Of those bomber escort missions, they lost bombers on only seven missions. And if you count the total number of bombers shot down, it was 27. The average number lost by the other fighter groups in the 15th Air Force was 46. So they lost significantly fewer bombers than the other groups in the 15th Air Force. And probably the most famous claim of the Tuskegee Airmen is they lost fewer bombers than the other fighter groups, partly because they were following uh, Colonel Davis's admonition to guard the bombers, bring the bombers back safely. And there were rumors, and I don't know how true this is, that the white fighter groups had more victory credits but lost more bombers because they were going after the enemy fighters. The enemy fighters would come up, sometimes they'd have decoys, and they'd lure the fighters away, the protective escort fighters away. And then the bombers were more vulnerable to other fighters who would show up and shoot them down. But the 332nd fighter group stuck with the bombers, and they didn't lose as many bombers as the other groups. Some of the Tuskegee Airmen became prisoners of war in Nazi Germany. This is one of them, Alexander Jefferson. He's still living today. He was somebody I became uh, friends with over the years, partly because he came to Maxwell. He was on a committee of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated who were investigating the false claim that the Tuskegee Airmen never lost a bomber. He was on a committee of original Tuskegee Airmen who looked at the documents and concluded that, yes, they, there were times when Tuskegee Airmen escorted bombers were shot down, and he was on that committee. When he was in Germany, he reported that it, some things surprised him. One of the things that surprised him was he was integrated with white officers. So he was in a more integrated environment in a Nazi prison camp than he would have been in Alabama at the time. Another thing that surprised him too is that
because he was an officer, he was not made to do any manual labor at the prison camp. And that might have been partly because Hermann Goering, who was the head of the Luftwaffe, the head of the German Air Force, was an Air Force officer, and he thought officers shouldn't have to do any work, even if they were enemy air officers. So Alexander Jefferson wrote a book about his experiences, Red Tail Captured, Red Tail Free, but he wasn't the only one. Harold Brown was another POW who wrote a book about his experiences. He came to, to Montgomery recently, to Maxwell, and spoke about his experiences. It's called uh, Keep Your Air Speed Up, the name of his book. He wrote it with his wife. And in that book, he has some interesting stories about what happened to him when he was shot down. He said that when his plane crashed, there were German civilians who wanted to kill him. And they probably would have. But there was one policeman that protected him and made sure he got to the Stalag, to the prisoner of war camp, and saved his life. But Harold Brown is also still living. Most of these Tuskegee Airmen are in their 90s, upper 90s. Many of the ones I've met over the course of the years have passed away. And somebody did research just this week on how many of the red-tailed pilots are still living. Anybody want to take a guess? There were about 1,000 pilots trained at Tuskegee. About 355 of them went overseas. Of the 355 that went overseas, it's believed there are only 13 left. And we have the names of, of the 13. Harold Brown and Alexander Jefferson are among them. This is the emblem of the 477th Bombardment Group. I want to say a little bit more about them uh, before we finish. The bomber pilots trained to go overseas, but they never went overseas because it took longer to train them because they started later. They were under the command of Robert Selway. Remember the guy at 332nd Fighter Group at Selfridge Field? He became the commander of the 477th because he had experience with black trainees. And at Freeman Field, he followed his old policy of keeping the facilities segregated. There were 120 black officers at Freeman Field who in various ways tried to integrate the officers club and they were arrested. It was a big controversy. They were arrested, they were incarcerated, but eventually they were exonerated. And the War Department, faced with this dilemma of what to do about the 477th, decided instead of integrating the facilities like Noel Parrish had done at Tuskegee Army Airfield, the War Department decided it would take the white officers that were in the 477th bombardment group and reassign them somewhere else and assign black officers and make it an all-black group. That way there would be no question about integrated facilities. And guess who they appointed to be the commander? Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., the same guy who had commanded the 332nd. The war in Europe was ending, so he came back and became the commander of the 477th Bombardment Group. Before I get off the slide, do you see any numerical significance of that emblem? Okay. We're two groups of seven bullets, that's right. So it's 477. They wanted people to know who they were. Four bombs and two groups of seven um, 50 caliber machine gun bullets. And it says, our hearts with our country, our eyes on the target. It reminds me of that civil rights series that was on TV a few years ago, remember? Eyes on the prize. And maybe they got it from this, I don't know. This is the type of plane the 477th Bombardment Group flew. Daniel Chappie James is one of the most famous Tuskegee Airmen. He became the first four-star black general in the Air Force, in any of the services. And he flew a fighter at first in training, but he was 6'4", and it was hard for him to fit in the fighter, the fighters at the time. Somebody suggested, well, maybe you should go over to the 477th and train to be a bomber pilot, and that's what he did. He became a member of the 477th. He wasn't arrested at Freeman Field. He wasn't among the ones arrested, but he was a member of the 477th. He continued to fly for the service. He flew in Korea, flew in Vietnam, eventually became 
the first four-star black general in the Air Force. This is a picture of Colonel Robert Selway, and I've already mentioned his policies uh, to keep the bases segregated. He was the commander of the 332nd before Davis, the commander of the 477th before Davis, before they became all black. This is my favorite picture of the Tuskegee Airmen, Benjamin O. Davis Sr. on the right, pinning a distinguished flying cross on his son, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. The first black general in the Army on the right, the first black general in the Air Force eventually on the left. Very famous family. Unfortunately, they had no children, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. and his wife. So we don't know what the Benjamin O. Davis III would have done. This is Daniel Chappie James, and I mentioned he was 6'4". He was a member of the 477th Bombardment Group. He served in Korea. He served in Vietnam. He became the highest ranking black general in the Air Force in any of the services, and he achieved that rank during the 1970s. This is a picture of me with Charles McGee. Charles McGee is another famous airman, a Tuskegee airman. He flew fighters in World War II overseas. He flew fighters in Korea, and he flew fighters in Vietnam. He had 409 combat missions, more than any other Tuskegee airman, not more than any Tus any. Air Force pilot, believe it or not, but among the top of all 409 combat missions, he's still living. He's 98 years old, and uh, Ellen has met him too. And by the way, he's wearing a medal. It's not the gold medal that was presented to the Tuskegee Airmen, because that's at the Smithsonian. He's wearing a Noel Parrish Award. He was the first recipient of the Noel Parrish Award. President Harry Truman, in 1948, integrated the, or mandated the integration of the armed forces with his Executive Order 9981. And it's believed that the record of the Tuskegee Airmen, how well they did in World War II, contributed to that. We don't have any direct evidence of that, but there's indirect evidence. Stuart Symington was a Missourian, just like Harry Truman, was the first Secretary of the Air Force and he helped Truman write the executive order. He was familiar with the record of the Tuskegee Airmen. This is a picture of the medal that was awarded by Congress. There was one medal, it's at the Smithsonian. There are replicas, bronze replicas of the medal that are, uh, are presented sometimes today, but not, there's only one congressional gold medal to honor them. And this is a copy of the book. I wanted, if it's all right, Amy, to open the floor for questions. Yeah, I'm going to grab some oh. Okay. I'd like to open the floor for questions. I'm about to finish my talk. There's so much more to say about the Tuskegee Airmen, but we don't have time to, uh, to go into all the details. But I'll try to answer your questions if you have any questions. If you would please raise your hand and either myself or Wesley will pass you the microphone. We're recording today's session. Uh, the field that was the training field, you referred to it as the Tuskegee, Airmen. Tuskegee Army Airfield. Was, was that also a, called Kennedy? No, Kennedy Field was the civilian pilot training facility where Eleanor Roosevelt went. Oh. That was the first airport owned by Tuskegee Institute where the civilian pilot training took place. Kennedy Field was closed after Moton Field opened up. And where was it located? It was out in the country. In fact, Jerome Ennels, who co-authored another Tuskegee Airmen book with me, we went to the site, and it's just an open field now. It's it's south of Tuskegee on the way to to uh, oh, what's the Union Springs? Yeah. And the other one that they trained at is lo was located what is now uh, north it's, of Interstate it's 85. It's northwest of. It's between Tallahassee and. Moton Field, Tuskegee. Okay. It is northwest, uh, about eight miles northwest of uh, Tuskegee. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm glad you mentioned that. When I was talking about Tuskegee Army Airfield, I meant, meant to mention that it had three large double hangars at Tuskegee Army Airfield for the basic and advanced flying training. All three hangars still exist. 
One of them is at the Montgomery Airport, one of them is at the Clanton Airport, and one of them is at the Troy Airport. So if you want to see a hangar that the Tuskegee Airmen used, you could go to the Montgomery Airport. And the Montgomery Aviation Hangar is one of those airports. I've been to all three and taken pictures of them. They're identical in shape and size. They're not identical in how well they're preserved. <laughs> you know, they, they're not painted the same way, but they're the same shape and size. Yes. Okay. We have that guy right there, and then you'll be next, sir. <laughs> How accurate was the uh, movie they made about the Red Tails? In your well, there were two movies made about the Red Tails. I'm glad you mentioned that. HBO movie called The Tuskegee Airmen was fairly good. It was a TV, made for TV movie, HBO movie, but it contained the false claim that they never lost a bomber. If they took that out, it would be a pretty good movie. Uh, but that was the one false claim in it. In Red Tails, there were a lot of inaccuracies. My two complaints about Red Tails, number one is when they showed the escorting missions, the fighters flying, escorting the bombers, they had the fighters flying within the bomber formations, and that's not the way they flew. The bombers flew as close together as they could, and the fighters would fly above them, or on the sides of them, in the front, or in the back, or below them, but they wouldn't fly within the bomber formations. That was very inaccurate. And I also didn't use the real names. I was disappointed about that because I was thinking anybody who goes to see the Red Tails movie might be inspired to look up more information about the Tuskegee Airmen. But they wouldn't find it under the names they used in the movie. They made up names. And I'm sorry they did that. John. Did the actual pilots of those red tails ever do anything to try to dispel the, the rumor that had gotten started? I mean, obviously well, they I think known. a lot of them didn't know whether it was true or not. And let me tell you why. Uh, most of the losses were in the summer of 1944. As time went on, a lot of the Tuskegee Airmen who were there in the summer of 44 went back and replacement pilots came over. And for seven months, they didn't lose any bombers for seven months. And so when the reporter came over there in April of 1945, no, March of 1945, uh, there was Roy Otley, a reporter for Liberty Magazine, came over and interviewed some of them. And he wrote that they didn't lose a bomber in 100 missions. That was the source of the, of the false claim. And Tuskegee, a lot of the Tuskegee Airmen pilots had never seen a, a Tuskegee Airmen escorted bomber go down because they hadn't gone down for six or seven months. I think that was part of the reason why. The, but some of them knew, the ones that were there in the summer, and Benjamin O. Davis Jr. knew because his citation for the Distinguished Flying Cross says that on June 9th, the mission for which he got it, he said he so skillfully organized his flying squadrons that they only lost a few bombers. And that particular mission, I checked and they only lost two, that, that mission. Any other questions? Okay, I wanted to allow enough time, if you want a copy of the book, I think they're going to be selling them, and I'll be glad to autograph copies. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.